worship today. Um, yeah, so everyone wants to stand to their feet. We're going to get into it um, to praise God, connect with Him, and just have a good time this morning.
If everyone wants to take a seat, that'd be great. I want to welcome everyone to church this morning. Welcome any guests that have come this morning. It's great to have you with us. Hello to everyone online who's um, joining in. Um, if anyone doesn't know me, my name is Josh. I am one of the team here at Activate. Um, and I'm just going to run you through a few few notices for the next few weeks or whatever's coming up. Um, so first of all, staying connected. If you are a guest here and you want to be connected in with the church and you want to know what's going on and you want to get the weekly emails that actually come out weekly now, which is quite nice. Um, or if you want to be a part of <laughs> the Facebook group, you can join on Facebook. But otherwise, you can leave your email, name or phone number out at the information station out in the foyer um, and you'll be put on the texting list, you'll be put on the emailing list and all that fun stuff. Um, tomorrow night, Monday night at 7pm, we have prayer meeting down here at church. So if you want to come down and um, pray for something in particular, just pray for the city, pray for the church, pray for someone, come on down and, and join in. Um, next Saturday, Women's Coffee Catch Up at the Old Vicarage Cafe on Horsell Road. Um, it's going to be 9am till apparently 11am, so it's going to be a few hours. Um, all the women, so I can't go, all the guys can't go, um, but if you're a woman, you can go. Um, catch up, have fun, get to know someone else, it'll be a good time for you guys. Um, next up as well is just a reminder of the roof repair, that our roof is broken, it's caved in in the women's room and all that fun stuff. So we're getting that fixed. Um, so just a reminder that Easter Sunday will be the last Sunday we're in here. And then we're going to be moving to City Church at 4 p.m. in the afternoon um, for, the, for the weeks that we won't have a roof here. Um, also, um, hands up if you know Jared. Yeah, I'm not Jared, but if you know him. Um, so Jared is Josh's brother, and he and his family have just gone over to the U.S. Um, he run, or he is the owner, runner of Fantails, Fantail Studios, and they've gone over to the U.S. to just have a, because um, they feel like God's told them to go over there and explore um, what he has for them over there. So he sent a wee video over of how that's going, which we are just going to watch right now. Hopefully. Christ Church, so awesome to see everybody. Hope you're doing so well. We're about a month into our three-month adventure here in the USA, just following the Holy Spirit's leading. So I thought, let's connect, take a moment, and I can share with you some of the things that God's been doing. I gotta tell you, the first thing that I've discovered traveling as the Van Burkle family with Rowanna and our three children, wow, traveling with children is so different to traveling with the film crew. I've traveled with the film crew all over the world now and I gotta tell you, it does not prepare you for traveling with three small children with different time zones and jet lag and lost luggage and all of those things. That has been uh, an adventure to start with, but oh my gosh, so fun on the other side of, uh, of all of that, seeing kids experiencing uh, what God is doing in a new place, coming into new cultures, new sounds, new cities, all of those things is also a whole lot of fun. Then I got the privilege to speak at a revival barn in Aiken, South Carolina. Some incredible worship, and then I was just sharing part of my testimony, a little bit of some fantail media, just all stuff just pointing to how awesome Jesus is. 
And then we opened it up for ministry and we started moving in word of knowledge and just touching people with the Holy Spirit. And it was just so fun being on the other side of the world, just ministering uh, with Holy Spirit, identity and destiny and all of those things. Um, it was a great time just building connections and building more relationship and all of those things. And then we, we kind of drove off from there to North Carolina up to Charlotte. And we spent about eight or nine days working with Derek Prince Ministries and just helping serve in that ministry for a week and a half with some of the immediate needs. And we've been just slowly building a deeper and deeper relationship with Derek Prince Ministries from filming with them in, in Africa to working with the local office in New Zealand and the digital team. And, and so it was just fun to be in America in the USA office and they had international directors from all around the world that we were just praying with, worshiping with, networking with, building deeper connections, sharing stories, and then just helping to serve their vision. We went from there to Atlanta, uh, which has been the city that's really been on Rayana's in my heart. And we, we've been in Atlanta now for about a week and a half. And the thing that's really struck me since we've been here is uh, God's really been challenging me around the film school. Now I've had it on my heart for a while to build a supernatural film school that people can access all over the world to learn how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, to be led by Christ, to be creating uh, films and documentaries with Him as an act of worship and then broadcasting them as an act of war. And it's something that I keep telling people, this is what's on my heart, this is something that I want to do. And I got here and within about 24 hours of being here in the city, he began to say to me, Jared, uh, you need to change your language. When I called you to launch Fantail Studios and make TV shows, you started telling people, I'm going down the Amazon and I'm gonna make our first TV show. We're doing it. I'm asking you now to build a school and you keep telling people, this is what I want to do. You need to change your language from what I want to do to what I am doing. You have to commit at a heart level that this is going to happen. Uh, no, no matter the cost, this is what God has asked me to do. Now that I'm here, Holy Spirit is, is really challenging me. Jared, you, you got to get serious with this. Uh, you got to start putting some dates on the calendar that you're going to launch this. This has to be something that you do, not something that you want to do. But it is, it's amazing what can happen when you actually get into the room, so to speak, that God's calling you to. Uh, and the way that he begins to speak to you when you're on location rather than the safety of your home comforts. And so that's the update so far. It's exciting what he's doing for everybody that's partnering with us. Thank you so much and looking forward to, to being back home and uh, but also at the same time thoroughly enjoying the adventure that we're on with Jesus as a family. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that looks like they're having a pretty fun time. They were at theme parks and stuff, and then, and then it got into all the God stuff. Um, so, but, so remember just to keep them in your prayers, um, especially praying around traveling with kids. That seems to be quite a challenge. Um, but just praying for them to uh, hear clearly where God wants them to go and where they, um, where they should be going, what they should be doing, stuff like that. Be awesome. Um, they should be planning to come back in the middle of May. Um, so we can hear more. Up. We might get another video from him, or we'll just hear about it all when he gets back. Um, so now if the kids want to stand up, or we're going to be sending the kids out. If everyone wants to stand up, actually, because we'll pray for the kids. But if you're intermediate, which is ages 10 and up, you can be staying in the church service today, which is pretty cool. But if you're not 10 and up, then you'll be going to the kids' service. But if everyone wants to um, put their hands out to the kids, um, then we'll just pray for them. Dear Lord, we just thank you that... Um, we have such an awesome group of kids in this church and such an awesome uh, kids ministry. Lord, we thank you each time that there is no junior Holy Spirit, that there is just you, there is just the Holy Spirit, um, and that you can speak to them and you can shape them and mold them and you can speak to them. Um, so Lord, we just thank you for that. We pray that they hear you, they learn more about you, and they grow closer with you today. And the intermediates can also enjoy being in the service and um, hear from you in here as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if the kids want to go out now, and we're just going to get back into some worship. So if you want to stay standing, then we'll, um, yeah, get into worship. Yeah. 
speak to them in your presence. Sometimes Sunday can just roll around and before we know it, it's the end of the week. But I just really feel that you would say to wait on the Lord, to wait on the Lord. And to be expectant. For God to pour out His Spirit upon
I love a church when I get a really strong sense that God has set us up for something. Uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, I'm Josh. I'm part of the team that leads here. And uh, I was down here this morning, sort of half past seven, and I was praying. And uh, a verse came into my heart. It's one of the ways that God speaks is he'll drop verses into your heart. That's why it's so important to read your Bible, know your Bible. It's one of the ways that God can just release something to you. And, and so a verse popped into my heart, and I'll share it in just a moment. And another thing that I felt God asked me to do this morning, He said, I want, you to, I want you to loose things. The Bible says that what we bind on earth is bound in heaven, and what we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. The Bible also says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. And so we have the power through our words and through our declaration to bind spiritual forces using our natural, natural, natural. I just decided, you know what? Two syllables is lame. Let's make that three. Natural language. And it, and it impacts the supernatural. And we have the power to loose things. And so God said, I want you to loose some things. And here's, here's the way God works for me is that I'll pray and I'll pray. And I'm like, ah, I feel something. Ah, I kind of feel something. Maybe I don't feel something. And then I'll say something, and God's like, that's what I wanted you to say. It took you a while to get there, Josh, but that's what I wanted you to say. And the only way I can describe it is that I feel this, this weight just hit me. Has anyone ever seen the ice bucket challenge? You know, people stand there, and then someone dumps a bucket of ice water on top of them. I like watching all the muck-ups on YouTube with my kids. People dropping the whole bucket on people, and it's pretty funny. But it's kind of that sort of feeling where I'm like, I'm just there and then this weight sort of hits me. And here's what I was loosing. I said, God, I loose healing. And he was like, that's good. And I said, I loose breakthrough. And he said, that's good. And I said, I loose freedom. And he said, that good. And then out of nowhere, I said, I loose tongues this morning. And God went, bang, that's what I wanted you to say. I loose tongues. And when I said it, I felt the weight and anyone that's been a part of this church for a while will know that when I feel weight, I can get a little bit teary. So I got a little bit teary. And so this whole morning, you know, I've been like, okay, what does that mean? I want you to lose tongues. And here's the Bible verse that God gave me before that. Psalm 81 verse 10. Uh, the Lord says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. So those are the two things that I had rolling around my head. I'm like, okay, tongues, you want to loose tongues? Do you want to loose the gift of tongues? Do you want to loose speaking in tongues? Do you want to just loose tongues? You want us to open our mouth wide so you can fill it? And then Josh just leans over to me because we were deciding who was going to say something. And he said, I just, I feel like God's saying there's something on the voices this morning. Good job. Well done. 
my little, my little mini me. Well done. So here's what, here's what God has said this morning. He said, I want to loose tongues. He said, I want you to open your mouth wide and I will fill it. And he said, there's something on the voices this morning. That's what we know. What do we do next? If you're a guest here with us this morning, this isn't unusual. This is kind of normal Sunday where God says stuff and then Josh gets up and tries to work out what to do. I'm, I've been wrestling with this all morning ever since God said loose tongues. I don't know any other way to put it. I feel like there is an anointing this morning to unlock speaking in tongues. And I know because I have spoken in person with different people in this church, I know that there are people in this church that have said, you know, I, I theologically I don't think that's something that's available for everybody. And my wrestle this morning, even when I was in the shower, I was wrestling with it because I was like, God, I feel like if I get up the front and I say, you want to release tongues, it, there's going to be people that are like, well, I don't, I don't think that's for me. I think Josh is wrong about that. And there was a huge part of me that was like, I don't really want to get up the front and say something and have people be like, I don't think that's right. Is that, does anyone else ever have that kind of thing? And, and then Josh again, during pre-meeting, he just said, I feel like obedience is really important. I'm like, shut up, Josh, man, you gotta stop talking. And so all, all I can do, church, this is me being as obedient as I can be. I feel like God said there is an anointing to loose tongues. And I don't know where you're at on that whole thing, this is my personal opinion, and I've done some reading on it, and I've done some Bible study, and I've listened to people that are much smarter than me, Derek Prince and stuff. I genuinely, this is my conviction, and I'm more than happy to have a conversation theologically with you afterwards. My conviction is that the ability to speak in tongues and to communicate with our Heavenly Father in a spiritual language is available for every single believer. That is my conviction. Happy to talk to you about it afterwards. The Bible talks about the gifts of tongues, it talks about the ability to interpret tongues, which is one gift. It talks about the ability to speak in other languages, which is another gift. And very often we confuse those two gifts with just the personal, spiritual speaking in tongues with us and our Father. Those two gifts are not necessarily available for everybody. But speaking in tongues, spiritually connecting with our Heavenly Father, that is available to every single believer. That's my conviction. So if you're here this morning and you go, look, I've not experienced that, that's okay. I would suggest to you that there are far, far more people in this room that have not experienced it than you think. And what the enemy loves to do is he loves to come along and say, you are the only one. Everyone else can do this but you. There's something wrong with you. And I want to tell you this morning, that's a lie. Why don't we just start to build that, that music up a little bit, team? How, how brave are you guys feeling this morning? I, I prayed for courage this morning because I felt like we were going to need courage this morning. If you were here this morning and you would say, Josh, praying in tongues is something that I, I either don't do it or I've tried it and I've felt stupid. I don't do it consistently. I don't kind of, it's not a part of my spiritual life. I feel weird about it. I don't understand it. If that is you this morning, there is an opportunity, I believe, for you to have breakthrough in that area. But you're going to have to receive this morning. And I don't think that you can do it sort of quietly in the background hiding. I think you're going to have to say, look, that's me and I'm prepared to go after it. So if that is you this morning and you would like to be someone that can, can speak in tongues, that can communicate on a heart level with your Heavenly Father, the Bible talks about groanings that we can't understand. Paul talks about praying in the Spirit, which in him, that means in tongues, on all occasions. 
If you want to elevate your prayer life from a natural prayer life to a supernatural prayer life, I want you to lift your hands this morning and we're going to pray for you. If you want breakthrough in that area. Look at this. We've got one, two, all the kids down the front have got their hands up. What is what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about kids? Does it say we should be more like kids or less like kids? More like kids. All these kids have got their hands up. All right, so what we're going to do, sorry. It's a, it's a wild thing seeing kids being touched by the Holy Spirit. I, I honestly don't know what to do. Why don't we do this? Why don't we say, if you want a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit, if you want your tongue to be loosened, if you want to pray in tongues, but also if you actually know, God's just saying, no, stick with that. I was going to be, I was going to give myself an out and just say, if you want to touch my Holy Spirit, then come up and then feel better about people coming up. But he's like, don't be a wimp. Yeah, it's good. Thank you, Denise. Glad you're back. <laughs> if you want to pray in tongues, I want you to come up the front. If you want to, you're not going to get any pressure from me. This is your decision. If you're like, you know what, I'm good. I'm good not praying in tongues. I think it's dumb. Then that's fine. You can just stay where you are. If you want to pray in tongues, come up the front. You kids just step right forward to this thing for me, okay? So there's room for people. I think this is seriously like one of the bravest things you can do is come up the front in front of people and say, I want, I want this. That's it. Just keep coming forward so we can see who's, who's in. Gene, I'm going to need to borrow you in a minute. I know there's more. Denise, I'm going to borrow you too. I know there's more, and I just want to say this, that sometimes, sometimes God creates an opening for something special. And so as much as I'd like to say, hey, look, you can come next Sunday and get prayer for praying in tongues. The anointing for that particular breakthrough will be, it's, it's here now this morning. Does that make sense? The anointing for that particular breakthrough, God has said, this is what I want to do this morning. Next Sunday, God might want to do something else. So this is your, this is your, your shot. Maybe he'll want to do it again next week. I don't know. don't know what that guy's up to half the time. All right. To say something? Yeah, I just felt the Lord is just saying, hey, um, for a lot of people, it can become head knowledge. You're trying to make something happen. Um, come on, I'm going to cry now. Tongues is about your heart. It's a heart language between you and God. It's, it's you bringing love to the Lord um, and not being able to express your love. And I, and I don't know if for people, sometimes we love people and we don't know how to express our love for them this is exactly the same thing and and so don't try to overthink things just whatever comes out whatever bubbles I I didn't know what tongues was when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit um, somebody come up to me and said hey look I'm just gonna put my hand on your head and just say Holy Spirit come and um, start talking to him like I'm talking to you right now and then if something comes out of your mouth and you don't understand it that's okay that's just your heavenly language that God's given between you and him it's your secret language I've held that now for 30 odd years and I've, 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 every time I don't know what to say to the Lord, every time I have a conversation with Him that it's, it's too much for me. I don't, I don't know how to express what's going on inside. Tongues comes out.
And oh my gosh, there's just the sense of peace and the sense of love and the sense of connection. I don't have a clue what I said to him, um, for him, with him, about him. It just comes and it's just the flowing. So just whatever, let, let it just, let it come out. Sometimes it's like a baby language. It's, you know, da, 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 and then it comes out and it, it becomes, you get a lot more words all together. Um, yeah, it, it comes in different ways. So don't try and overthink it. Just, just start focusing on the Lord and letting Him start to stir your heart. I heard a great statement the other day. I don't know who it was, but they said, God doesn't make tables, but He does make trees. What they meant by that is that we partner with what He gives us to create. And speaking in tongues is like that. I've, I've heard people like Garth from City Church, the pastor at City Church, he's come in and shared his testimony here. And he was someone that wasn't a Christian and got woken up at three o'clock in the morning with just unable to control the words that were coming out of his mouth to the point where he clapped his hands over his mouth and he just could not control it. That's wild to me. That was not my experience at all. We've had Ian Wright come in. He talks about being sat in a chair in the middle of a room as a young man, everybody praying for him and feeling like a hive of bees was in his belly and it came buzzing out and he prayed in tongues without stopping for, you know, an hour. That was not my experience. My experience was coming up the front one Sunday, couldn't even tell you when, because I went, God, I want to be able to connect with you on the deepest level possible. Somebody prayed for me. And they said, just start speaking in tongues. And I had nothing bubbling inside of me, nothing wanting to come out of my mouth. And my head said, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. They said, just start saying stuff. And so I went, bada, 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 you know, bada, honda, shura, bada, suzuki, bada, 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 whatever it might be. And and the enemy comes and he attacks your intellect and he says, "You you don't even know how dumb you look right now. This is ridiculous. And so my experience was just, Hubba bubba, bubba dubba, cubba bubba, mubba fubba, dubba, shumma. They got a bit close. Du, 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 du. You know, and, and that was where I started. And then I just committed to every morning, just, just doing a little bit more and a little bit more. And honestly, sometimes when I'm praying in tongues, I'm like, ah, I don't know if I'm really making any sense. And then I'll feel the presence of God come and I'll know that I'm praying for something. And sometimes God will say, this is what you're praying for right now. And I'll get a picture of what I'm praying for. And I'll know that that's what I'm hitting in the spirit. Uh, and when I don't know what to pray, that's what I pray. When I don't know what to sing, that's what I sing. It is, it is, inc- it is an incredible privilege to be able to connect with your Heavenly Father, bypassing your intellect and just connecting with your spirit. And so my encouragement to all of you this morning is that when we pray for you, and we'll come around, we will pray for every single one of you. And everybody that hasn't come up, I just assume that you're all tongue-speaking, Holy Spirit-filled Christians. So you're going to be reaching your hands out and you're going to be praying in tongues and you're going to be declaring God's purposes for these men and women of God. But when we come and we pray for you, uh, I specifically felt there was something on loosing tongues. So we're going to lay hands on you and we're going to loose your tongue. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to just start speaking in tongues. And you might have one syllable that you just say over and over and over again. That's beautiful. You might have a bunch of things. And I've got a couple of other things that I'll say at the end. But why don't we do that this morning? Right now, if you're sitting down and you speak in tongues, I want you to reach out. I want you to start praying in tongues. Um, where have we got? We've got Jean. We've got Denise. Where's Steve Forrester? Up you come, Steve. That'll be helpful. That'll be great. Uh, Marla, I might get you to just sort of stand behind some people. And, and Stephen, if he's around as well. All right, you guys are doing awesome. What I want you to do is I want you to ratchet your volume up by like 10, 10 times. I tell you what praying in tongues does. For those of you that do pray in tongues, praying in tongues absolutely terrifies the enemy. All right, so Steve, Gene, Denise, what I want you to do is I want you to just lay hands on someone. I want you to loose their tongue and when you get the when they say loose their tongue I want you to just speak something out I want you to bypass your brain I want you to not worry about how it sounds what it looks like how you appear to other people just between you and God all right
Come on, let's stand, church. Let's stand this morning.
dan Significant, significant things happening up the front church. You might not be able to see it, but in particular, the, the children. God's doing something significant with our kids this morning. Uh, we made the decision a couple of months ago that one Sunday a month we were going to leave the intermediate children into the service, believing that you know, God wanted to impact them in a different way. So three out of four Sundays they're in their programs, but once a month they stay in. Light change was on point. Just wow. Um, I'm not. I'm not even going to remotely pretend to understand 99.9999 percent of what God does. But I think if you said to me, Josh, make a list of things that you don't understand. Up the top would be like, why do some people get healed and other people don't? You probably have that. That would be like right at the top. Like I don't understand that. Um, but close to the top of the list would be praying in tongues. I don't understand that. I don't understand why God has set things up like that. I heard Derek Prince say once that very often, uh, right in front of a promise, God will put an obstacle. And he does that because he wants to see how serious you are about receiving the promise. Before the Israelites entered the promised land, they had some battles to fight. They had some giants to defeat uh, so for everybody that came up the front, first of all, I just want to say that I could not be more proud of you. I know what it's like to get up the front and, and stand, and you feel like everybody's looking at you, and that's just not true. That's not what people are doing at all. Everybody is it's just really excited to see you coming up the front and experiencing freedom. But uh, I want to say to all of you, to the kids as well, that what you need to be very aware of now is that you will leave this place and the first thing the enemy will do is try and shut down what happened this morning. The first thing he will do is he will say, that, what ha- that was a disaster what happened this morning. What a joke. What a mess. Worship's supposed to be orderly. That's, that, what was that? That's, and the speaking in tongue things, oh my gosh, you've bought into, you're in a cult. You're in a cult now. That's, you're in a cult. You went to a church, some guy got up the front and just spoke gibberish, and then now you think that's the right thing to do? Like You've got to get out of that place. And so I want to encourage you to continue to grow your your language. Speaking in tongues is like any other language. You don't just, it's my experience anyway, you don't just become fluent straight away. Like I, I've made many jokes here about the fact that I'm trying to learn Spanish. And I can tell you what, that's it's a process, right? You learn a couple of words. Like the first, when you learn Spanish, the first thing you learn is like, you know, mi nombre es Josh. Good luck cracking that code, right? You learn, you learn, like you're learning Arabic at the moment, right? What a sucker. Arabic, man. Jeremy's learning Arabic. Now, when you started learning it, did you just wake up the next morning and be like fluent? Got like the matrix download. Now I can speak it. No, you, you learn like a little bit and then you learn a little bit more and then a little bit more. And it's like that with tongues. You've got to practice it. You've got to practice it. But the cool thing about practicing tongues is when you're practicing tongues, you're praying, you're connecting with God. Uh, you're shifting things in your life. And the biggest battle that you need to fight, and this is where tongues is such a a weird thing, the biggest battle you need to fight is just how weird it is. 
I'm not even going to pretend for a second that it's not flipping weird. I'm not standing up here saying, oh, it's normal, guys. Like, you could pray out in tongues on the bus and people just think it's normal. That's not true. Fortunately, I don't feel like God's ever told me to get super vocal in tongues in public, which is good. Um, I touched on it before. Derek Prince has got a really interesting teaching on tongues. Um, and he talks about the fact that in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, when it talks about the different gifts, the gifts of healing, the gifts of hospitality, the gifts of this, it talks about the gifts of, of uh, the actual um, original Greek says all kinds of tongues. And he talks about the fact that there are different types of tongues in the Bible. And so one of the tongues he talks about is the gift of uh, understanding tongues. And so Paul talks about in a worship context, like if somebody gets up, grabs a microphone, and just rabbits off a minute of praying in tongues, that's not overly helpful because most of us can't understand that. But he says if someone has the gift of interpretation, then they can get up and say, okay, here's what was said. Then it's kind of helpful. Uh, another gift uh, or another example of tongues would be speaking in other languages. And he tells the story, Derek Prince, about one time his stepdaughter brought her new boyfriend to church. And he said he was preaching and he was doing a fine job. And already I am more interested in Derek Prince because that guy is, like he says good stuff, but man, if you've ever listened to him talk, it is hard work. And he was preaching his message, and then he said right at the end of his message, this random old guy in his church, he's a little bit kooky, gets up, just stands up in front of everybody and just speaks out in tongues for like 60 seconds. No one knew what the heck was going on, and Derek Prince was miffed. He said, it, it, it just ruined my whole flow. I had a thing I was going, it just ruined it. And what he didn't realize, because he was going to have a chat to this guy afterwards, but this stepdaughter's boyfriend came up the front, and he was from Wales. And he said, why did that man stand up and tell the whole church every sin I've ever committed in Gaelic? <laughs> he was the only person that understood what was being said. And no one else, and Derek Prince said it took them a good 10, 15 minutes to convince the kid that it was a, t a God thing, that no one else knew Gaelic or whatever the Welsh language was, and that it was something that, and he said, look, God does something like that, do you reckon that gets his attention? That's why if you read the Bible, it says that the gift of tongues is for unbelievers. It's talking about the gift of speaking in other languages. But the ability to speak in our own spiritual language, that is something that uh, I very strongly believe is available for each and every one of us. You guys good? Would it be all right if you just like high five somebody and gave me a minute to grab a drink? Is that okay? Because, yes, please. So if high five someone, say good day, while I just gather my thoughts. You know what? I could do that. I've got a spare T-shirt in the car. I could just put like a. Is it how noticeable is it? Okay, thanks, guys. All right, you guys good to go? Good to rock and roll? Yes? Yes, your kid's good? Um, all right, we're going we're gonna to wing it. Uh, I was talking to Kristen Williams during the week. Kristen Williams, uh, some of you will know he came down last year, he spoke at this church. Uh, some of you will know Kristen Williams because he's been around forever. He was huge back in like, who remembers Get Smart? Anybody remember Get Smart, right? He was, he was massive back then, and he, he passed as a church up in Tauranga. And I like talking to Kristen because he's just much smarter than I am. And he's much more experienced than I am, and he's been doing this church pastoring thing for a long time. In fact, I was talking to him on Wednesday, and he was telling me that he had to speak at a young adults camp this weekend. And I said, you must have done that a lot. He said, you know what? He said, I was thinking about it during the week, 
and I, I worked out that between the young adults camps, the youth groups, the youth conferences, the young adult events, he said, I think I have preached over a thousand times. That's like 40 times a year for 25 years. That is a lot of speaking. So this guy is, is fun, and I like ringing him and talking to him about stuff. And So we were chatting, and he said, what are you going to preach about on Sunday? And I said, Kristen, I don't know. I said, what are you going to preach about on Sunday? And he said, Josh, I don't know. And so we talked about it a bit more, and he said, do you know what your problem is, Josh? And I said, no, but Liz will tell you. <laughs> he said, your problem is that it's not that you've got nothing to speak about. It's that you've got all of these things that God's kind of talking to you about, and you can't work out which one to share. And he said, that's my problem. And I said, ah. He said, so when you think about what you are going to talk about, once you've got a topic, he said, Flip me a text and I'll, I'll pray for you. Um, but what I've decided to do is just talk about all of it at once. Everything, everywhere, all at once. I'll win seven Oscars. Um, God has been talking to me about a couple of really big things uh, over the last month or so. And it's, it's actually, I found it quite unsettling. Uh, and it's, it's been, you guys want to hear an awesome word? It's been discombobulating. Uh, I haven't, he has interrupted my day on numerous occasions to talk to me about something that I was not interested in talking about. It's not something that we've ever discussed. And he's just said, we need to talk about this. And so what I've got for you this morning, Jesus would often... Uh, follow up a parable or a lesson or a teaching by making this statement, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And it's a very poetic way of Jesus saying, hey, look, there's a truth in this that is easy to miss if you're just listening on a surface level. But if you engage your heart and you engage your spirit, you will pick up what I am saying on a whole nother level. And I just feel that that's available for us this morning, that I'm going to share a couple of things, and this is not an overly traditional message, but I'm just going to share you three things that God has interrupted me to talk about. And I want to say that, you know, he or she who has ears, let them hear. The temptation is for you to go, oh, that's nice. That was a, that was a good wee thing. And then go home and just carry on with what you're doing. But actually, there is a, uh, a real weightiness to what I'm about to share. And I think if you, I encourage you to go home, think about it, talk to God about it. If you're in a relationship, talk to the person that you're in a relationship with, if that's appropriate and say, look, what, what do we think about that? How are we going to respond to what our pastor says he thinks God is saying? Um, and two of the things I'm going to share, I've already touched on or spoken on recently, but the third thing is something that I have never, ever spoken on in church. And I've had people ask me if I would speak on it, and I've always said, nah, I'll speak on it if I feel like God tells me to speak on it. And then he has told me, well, that sounded very spiritual. He is talking to me about it, and I just want to share it with you guys. So, if you want to take notes and you want to call this message something, let's call it three things that God is calling us to. And when I say us, I mean, first of all, me. These are three things that God is calling me to. Second of all, I think these are three things that God is calling us to here at Activate. And then I think God is actually calling the entire body of Christ to these three things. And some churches will respond, some Christians will respond, and some won't. And that's fine. The first thing that I think God is calling us to is obedience. We talked a couple of Sundays ago, do you guys remember I talked about the fact that we have this habit of downgrading God's instructions to his invitation, and then we can politely decline his invitation without feeling guilty or carrying any kind of like, oh, I'm living in disobedience. So God will tell us to do something. And again, first of all, this is to me. God's had this conversation with me. I've told you to do things, Josh, and you've been like, that's a good thought, that's a nice idea. That's a helpful suggestion. And then you park it in the, I'll have a think about it category. And he says, you, you know, like I've got specific things in my brain that I can reflect on and go, I know that was not a helpful suggestion. That was God telling me to do something and I haven't done it. 
Anybody else got anything like that in their world? You guys are all better Christians than me. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, God comes to Samuel the prophet, and he says, hey, the Israelites are getting pretty tanked by the Amalekites. They keep wading in and killing people and you know, doing horrible things. So I want you to go to Saul, the king of Israel, the commander of the Israelite army, and I want you to tell Saul that he's got the green light to go and destroy the Amalekites. Let's just get rid of this problem once and for all. And when you do, make sure you tell him that he has to destroy everything. I don't want him bringing home spoils of war. I don't want him bringing home treasures. I don't want him bringing home goods. I just want him to destroy everything, and then we can move on. And so Samuel tells Saul, that's what you need to do. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul goes and does half of it. He destroys the Amalekites, but he brings home the treasure. He brings home the best of their livestock. He even, amazingly, brings home their king as a prisoner. And God comes to Samuel and says, look, you've got to go talk to Saul. He's not doing what I've asked him to do. And I love the story because Samuel rocks up and he says to Saul, hey, you were supposed to destroy everything. And Saul goes, yeah, I did. And then I just love the sass of Samuel. He goes, oh, yeah? Uh, what's that? What's that noise? What am I hearing here, guys? I'm hearing, I'm hearing sheep. It sounds like cows. I think I'm hearing some goats sparring over there. So what's, what's all that noise? And Saul says, well, I, you know, I, I kept all the best stuff, but we're going we're gonna to sacrifice it to God. And then Samuel makes this incredibly profound statement, which you hear regurgitated at church from time to time. He says, to obey is better than sacrifice. And here's where Saul's thinking was. Saul was like, I'm going to half obey God and half not obey God. And I'm going to use my disobedience. This is crazy. I'm going to use my disobedience as an excuse for worship. How crazy is that? And I just feel like God is saying, I am looking for obedient Christians. I'm looking for Christians that will just do what I ask them to do. Uh, they're not going to take it as a suggestion. They're not going to take it as uh, a good idea, but it's an instruction from the King of Kings. The first thing that God said to me is, I am calling you, me, you, the body of Christ, I'm calling you to obedience and the second thing, and again, I'm not going to spend long on these two things because we've already talked about it. The second thing I feel like God is calling us to is discipleship. And we've talked about that a lot in the last couple of weeks. And actually, obedience is the foundation to discipleship. And we've talked about discipleship and the difference between our Western mindset of discipleship being theological and educational. Let's put people in the classroom and disciple them. And actually, Jesus' definition of discipleship is just, you do what I do. And so what God has been talking to me about is that discipleship, true biblical Christian discipleship as Jesus meant it, can only be measured by action. It can only be measured by obedience. And we've played around with a few different definitions of discipleship, but I've decided my favorite is that discipleship is, or a disciple is someone who actively and intentionally imitates Jesus Christ until they become a living copy of him actively and intentionally imitates Jesus Christ. And that word actively means that it's not passive, it's not theological, it is defined by action. So if you want to work out whether you are a disciple of Jesus Christ or not, you can just look at your actions. I don't want to get bogged down by this too much, but God said that the church is filled with believers, but very few disciples. Because the benchmark for believing is very low. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Great. Thank God for grace. But disciple is a whole other thing entirely. Disciple is someone that is following Jesus. In, in Jesus' day, a disciple would follow their rabbi so closely that the dirt from the rabbi's sandals would flick up and hit you in the legs. That was how close you had to follow. If you weren't close enough to get dirty from their Scuff up, so you weren't following closely enough. So the first thing God's calling us to do is to obey. The second thing God's calling us to is discipleship. And then here's the third thing. I'm just really curious to see how this goes down. 
Uh, and all I can do is tell you what happened and then leave it for you to kind of work out. But it's rattled me a little bit. Something that I have never talked about in church and never really had any leading to talk about or anything like that is in times. Eschatology, which is a fancy word for anything to do with the end times. Now, straight away, everyone over the age of 50 has leaned forward and gone, oh, here we go. Come on, come on, right? Because if you're over 50, you read Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth and you had people come in and talking about prophecies and all that kind of stuff. And if you're under 40, you kind of kick back and went, oh, here we go, right? So over 50s were like, here we go. Under 40s were like, here we go. And I think that's because there was, there was, and I was talking to Kristen Williams about this, there's, there was a big pendulum swing. Like in the, in, the, in the 70s and in the 80s and in the early 90s, it was like end times this and when's God coming back and, you know, we've got to know what's happening and who's the Antichrist? I think it could be this person. And, and okay, that happened. And then there was a new generation of Christians came up and they were like, I don't really want to get into all of that. I'm just going to focus on what I'm doing. And so there's a pendulum swing. And people will say to me, I've been pastoring this church for coming up four years, people will say, are you going to, you going to do a series on end times? And I always go, no. And they say, why not? And I say, because God hasn't told me to do a series on end times. If God tells me to do a series on end times, then, well, first of all, I'll have to work out what I think. But, like, honestly, if you said to me, what do you think? Are you, like, rapture, yes or no? I'm like, I don't know. Are you amillennial, premillennial? I'm like, I don't, just a regular millennial? <laughs> you know, like, what, what I'm like, I, I don't know. I mean, I read the Left Behind book series, which was pretty fun for the first half dozen. Then I realized that they were just dragging this thing out, and I stopped reading them. But if you were to sit me down and say, look, what is your end time theology? I'd say, I don't really have one. I just kind of, what I say is that, look, I know for sure that we are closer to the end today than we were yesterday. And then I kind of pat myself on my back for being so wise. But here's, here's the weirdest thing that happened. All right, so God's talking to me about obedience, and he says, you need to understand obedience because that is the key to being a disciple. And then I'm, like, I'm talking, I'm like, well, why do I need to be a disciple? Like, why is discipleship so important now as opposed to any other time? And the other day, I'm watching sport. I love sport. I love playing sport. I love watching sport. I love talking about sport. Uh, I played soccer all my life growing up. I gave rugby a go for a year and sucked. So I went back to soccer. And... Uh, First time I ever played rugby, I played soccer all my life. And then I decided, you know what? I think I'm probably good enough to be an all-black if I just gave rugby a go. So, I mean, soccer's way harder. Rugby, you just got to catch and run. Like, soccer, you got to do all this stuff. And so I thought I'd give rugby a go. And, and I was 17, and my mum was like, well, rugby's a bit dangerous. I'm like, ah, it's not. It's fine. It's, it's fine. But, unfortunately, I joined a team from Kaiapoi. And they were rough. And on my very first, I'm not even joking, my very first game, one of my team kicked another guy in the head while he was on the ground, knocked him out. We had to stop the game. We had to call the ambulance. The ambulance came, couldn't get onto the field because there was a chain across the field, so they had to call a fire department. This is my first game of rugby. The fire service turned up. The ambulance turned up. And this because my team did it. I remember my coach pulling me aside one day. And he says, hey, look, if there's a big you know, scramble for the ball and all the players are in there, just find someone on your team and punch them as hard as you can in the back of the head. I said, what? My, my? He said, yeah. And then when they pop up, I'm like, who did that? You point to someone on the other team. You say, it was them. He said, that's how you, that's how you get them riled up. So I didn't last very long in my rugby career. I was like, that's, you know what? I'm just too nice for this sport. So I got into soccer. Anyway, I just felt like you needed some lighthearted, funny stuff before I tell you the next thing. I'm watching rugby the other day, and I'm not talking to God. I'm not in the middle of a quiet time. I don't have my Bible open. I'm just watching TV. And out of nowhere, God says this to me. He says, hey, does the way you play the game change depending on how much time is left? And I went, sorry, I'm watching rugby, God. What are you, like, you know, you can talk to me at church. You can talk to me in my quiet time. But this is my space. So what are you doing? I said, what? He said, does the way you play the game change depending on how much time is left? 
And I thought about it, and I said, yes. He said, what changes? I said, well, like when you, when you play soccer, soccer's a long game. It's 45-minute halves. So it's an hour and a half of running around. So when you kick off, you don't just run around like your head's been torn off because after 15 minutes, you've got no energy left and you're done. So you have to pace yourself. You've got to go, okay, we've got 90 minutes to go. And so you put in the hard yards when the ball gets near you. And then you, when the ball goes out for a goal kick, you stop, you have a bit of a rest. And when the ball's on the other side of the field, you kind of walk around a bit. But how many people know that when there's five minutes to go, the way you play changes? You just give it everything you've got because there's five minutes to go. And you say, to heck with my energy levels, I don't want to leave anything out on the field. In fact, I'll, I'll go and I'll watch Harrison play football. And I stand on the sideline and I hear people talking. And, you know, there's always one parent that's in charge of keeping time. And that person will invariably say, you know, because the refs are just parents on the field. And so they'll often turn about, how much longer? And some parent yells out, five minutes. And when they do that, I say, Harrison, there's five minutes to go, mate. Come on, man. Give it everything you got. There's no point in having energy left over. Like, just don't stop running. Run everywhere. And like when I played, if there was five minutes to go, it didn't matter where I was on the field. I just, I just ran everywhere. I was like, we've got five minutes left, guys. We've got to do this. Does that make sense? You all under, who's ever played sport? Like, you guys know what it's like. Five minutes to go, 10 minutes to go. You just, you just give it everything you've got. And so God said, does the way you play change depending on how much time is left? And I said, Yes. And he said, does the way you live change depending on how much time is left? And I said, yes, it m must do. And so the third thing that I think God is calling us to, first of all, obedience, because it is the key to discipleship. But discipleship, because I believe he's calling us into this third thing, and that is to understand the times. Now, the Bible, amazingly, if you read it, has a lot to say about the end. Jesus had a lot to say about end times. Here's what we know. We know that no one knows the day or the hour. That's what the Bible says. Anytime anyone says to you, God's coming back on 7th of June, you can be like, no, no man knows the day or the hour. Someone says to you, God's coming back at 4 p.m. No. No one knows the day of the hour. But, and I'm just playing with you here, the Bible doesn't say that no one knows the week. Like, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that no So I'm just saying, if, if someone literally said to you, hey, God's coming back next January, you can't say, no, no man knows the month. It's not in there. Now, I'd still be very weary of someone making a prediction like that. But my point is that, the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour, but Jesus also says, man, you need to be able to read the times. And, and I, think that, I think that we need to start, and I may speak to this, but the problem is, is that before I can speak to it, I've got to work out with God what he wants me to say. I think that we are entering a season, and I don't know what this means, and this is where I say it makes me uncomfortable. I'm not saying, hey, guys, the world's going to end in the next 10 years. We've got to do everything. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I feel like there is a weight from God and a leading and a calling to understand the season that we're in. That's what I'm saying. To understand the times that we are in because if we don't understand how much longer there is, if we don't understand the time that we're in, if we can't even tell the difference between whether we're in the first half or the second half, whether we've just kicked off, whether there's five minutes to go, if we can't tell the difference, if we don't know where we are in the game, then we can't adjust the way that we play accordingly. And I feel like God is saying, I want you to understand the times because if you don't understand the times, then a lot of the other stuff that I'm going to be talking to you about is not going to make sense. That's the context around which I want to lead you. Does that make sense? Have I still got all of you under 40s? You guys are okay? I love that you nodded, Esther. That's cute. Just, just a little bit. Just a little bit over. That's all right, yeah. I would also nod. If someone said under 40s, I'd be like, that's still me. I'm still under 40 spiritually, emotionally intellectually. 
every, every way except physically, I'm under 40. <laughs> Stop it. <clears throat> so I'm going to leave it there. But those, those are the three things. God is calling us to obedience. I want you to go away and really think about what that means and ask yourself the question. You know, Paul talks, I can't remember what Bible uh, book it's in, but at one point he says, you need to examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Like there is something to be said about going away and looking at yourself in a spiritual mirror and actually taking stock. Where am I at? When it comes to obedience, how obedient am I? And I would say, look, well, just go back over the last few things that God has talked to you about or that you've heard at church or that you've had this random thought, I should do this or I should do that or I should not do this, I should not do that. And then ask yourself, what well, actually, am I living in obedience or am I just taking these suggestions and then ignoring them? Second thing he's calling us to is discipleship. And again, that can only be measured through obedience. See, guys, have a good day. It can only be measured through obedience. Discipleship is not about what you know. It's not about what your theology is. It's not about what you think. It's not about what you say. It can only be measured through your actions. James says that faith without works is dead. He says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. How dead is a body with, is anyone ever, no one asked that question. I've seen, I've seen a dead body without a spirit in it. It's weird. That, that thing is dead. You think about how dead a dead body is without a spirit in it. Like, it's dead. That's what a Christian is without action, according to James. Just, just a husk. All right, so uh, discipleship is measured through action. And then the last thing he's calling us to is to be aware of the times, to understand the times. And maybe that's something that we need to explore as a church. But I honestly don't know because I'm just telling you what God's been telling me. Is that cool? All right. Give me a wave if you're okay. This is a weird Sunday morning, right? This is a normal, this probably is more normal Sunday morning. At least you kind of got a message this morning. Last week you got nothing. All right. Okay. Um... How do you want to end it? How do you? Bye. <laughs> Bye. See ya. Go home. Bye. If you're watching online, Rose says we're done, so it's, it's fine. Yeah, if you're a guest with us this morning and you're like, I don't know what just happened, um, feel free to stick around and ask. Don't ask me because I don't know either, but ask somebody else and they'll give you some context to what's going on. Otherwise, go and find someone. Say hi. Offer to buy them a coffee. It's free, so you can get away with it. And hang out for a bit. Is that cool? All right. If there's anyone here that needs prayer for anything in particular that you felt wasn't offered this morning, then come up the front, and uh, we can pray for you as well. Nathan will put on some music for you, and we'll go there.